slightest question about is supposed to be given to the defense? I don't disagree with that, but I'm offering to turn my whole file over to somebody else. And I'm suggesting that in terms of the pieces that I don't usually disclose, that's at least a way of ventilating it. That's all I was trying to say. Yeah. Well, my concern with that is that nobody but the defense lawyer is going to appreciate the full import of it. And I don't know how to fix that other than to require open file production unless there's a threat, obviously, to a witness. I mean, in a mob case where there are hits on people, you can't give the names of people and you have to take steps to protect the innocent. But the information can be given to the defense to allow an adequate defense. Yeah. But, Cindy, I, I guess the one area I disagree with you, you keep saying the Supreme Court has said, if you have any question in your mind at all, turn it over. I think the message from the Supreme Court is not that at all. Uh, if it's material, turn it over. And only if we think it's material after the conviction, when we look at the conviction and say, well, you had all this evidence, sure, that might have helped the defense, but it wouldn't have resulted in a different verdict. That's, that's, that's a different kind of, of message there. Um, and so I think, I, I think the Supreme Court is not, coupled with the Supreme Court rulings you know, on, on immunity, which say even when the office, right, the, the office of the DA <laughs> has practices and policies that almost encourage this. Um, John was involved in the Connick case, the Connick versus Thompson, and wrote about it. Uh, you have the New Orleans office where these were repeated violations. Um, guy serves um, 14 years, almost put to death, comes within 48 hours of being put to death, and the Supreme Court takes away a $14 million verdict uh, against the office of the DA, uh, where it was pretty proven that this was a repeated right uh, pattern in that office, and the Supreme Court washes its hands of it. So. I would put more responsibility, actually, on, on, on the court. I agree with putting more responsibility on the court, too. If you read the transcript of the Supreme Court's, the oral argument in the Smith versus Cain case, it looked to me like at least four Supreme Court justices don't even understand the materiality requirement themselves. They think prosecutors are obligated to produce anything favorable to the defense without the materiality filter when there are Supreme Court decisions that confuse the heck out of the whole standard. There is very clear language that the prosecutor is not supposed to tack close to the wind and if, if there's any doubt, produce it. But at the same time, David's right. There are all kinds of cases out there that have refused to reverse on grounds of materiality. Uh, I know there are lots of non-lawyers in the audience and I don't want to get into a detailed discussion of, of the law and how that could be fixed, but you know we've just got to get a more clear rule that if there is any question at all, produce it. They're going toward open file as much as we can and affirmatively holding any prosecutor accountable who doesn't do what they're supposed to do. The Department of Justice is now seeking to impose a materiality requirement in Rule 3.8 in every state in the country and at the federal level too. And if they can do that, they completely eviscerate the ethical rule. Because not only do they have the hammer of, of saying it's not material, they even redefine the view of the case. For example, if there's something, as in the Stevens case or the Merrill case, that is exculpatory of the defense and should be produced, they'll say, oh, that was just said with a wink and a nod. That wasn't really exculpatory. That was just said with a wink and a nod, and they'll take the exculpatory thing and make it inculpatory on that basis. So then they don't have to produce that either. So to, to Dean Epps's point and the structure, uh, the Michael Morton Act, 